think bugs are creepy? Is crawling something that has to be gross? Babies crawl, but we're not scared of them. Sometimes when we're scared of things, it helps to learn more about it. People around the world keep lots of different bugs as pets. Crickets, katydids, praying mantises, and scorpions are just a few examples. In Japan, there's a long tradition of keeping all kinds of insects as pets, but specifically night singing male crickets. They were used as alarms because they would stop singing if someone new came into the house. People have made cute tiny houses for their cricket friends for a long time, like this one or this one. People often keep earthworms as pets. The rings you see on them are called annuli, and they have tiny, tiny hairs on them called setae that let them move around through the soil. Earthworms can't bite you, and they don't take a lot of work. They're really good for the soil, and they can help your garden grow. Sometimes they're even used as classroom pets. Crickets aren't just used for pets themselves. Sometimes they're pet food. Crickets and mealworms are often used as food for pet lizards, such as the green anole, who is indigenous to Texas, and the blue-tongued skink. Now, you might see these cute critters outside, but if you want one for a pet, make sure you buy one from a pet store or breeder. Catching one in the wild isn't good for the animal. Crickets come in lots of different shapes and sizes. When you're buying them for pet food, often the variety the pet store will have is one of those teeny tiny brown varieties. Be careful and don't catch crickets from outside to feed your pet. They can hurt the lizards if you're not careful. Crickets can bite your small lizard friend, but usually humans are much too big, so they can't bite us. Another pet you might know about is the cute little hedgehog. This guy eats bugs, but he doesn't live in the wild over here in the United States. Here, they're only pets and they do need some special care. They eat almost exclusively bugs in the wild. They're known as insectivores. They like to be left alone, so they don't make the very cuddly friends, but they sure are cute. Creepy Crawlies, we've spotted. Creepy crawlies can be found just about anywhere on Earth. In fact, entomologists, or people who study insects, estimate that there are over 200 million insects per person on the planet. Let's see if we can find some here in my backyard. As we look around, notice their colors and how they move, and see if you can figure out what shenanigans they might be up to. Like, are they looking for food, or are they building a house? Come on, I think I see some over here. You might know this creature as a roly-poly because of the way they roll into a ball when they get disturbed. They may also be known as pill bugs or doodle bugs, but their real name is armadillo diode. It sounds like an armadillo, but it's a type of crustacean like what a shrimp is. And here, there's something interesting on this plant, but there's also a wasp flying close by, so I'm gonna stay away. Sometimes insects are really hard to spot because they're camouflaged into their surroundings. But just like with anything, the more you practice, the better you get. Can you see the grasshopper hiding here? At first I thought it was a cricket, but crickets have really long antenna and this one has short ones. I'll move the grass by it to make it jump so you can see it better. Other common things you might find in Texas are stink bugs, like this one I found crawling on a tree, caterpillars, and what do caterpillars turn into? Butterflies. You might see lots of butterflies and moths flying around. Texas also has lots of spiders. This is an orb weaver spider. Sometimes orb weaver spiders build their webs with this distinct zigzag shape in them. There are so many different names to call all these creatures. Does anyone else get confused which one is which? There are bugs, insects, spiders, which are also known as arachnids, 
it's a lot. So we called in a local bug expert. Lisa is a Texas master naturalist and a master volunteer entomology specialist. Lisa, can you help us figure out how to tell the difference between all these different creatures? So remember, insects have three body parts. One, two, three. This is the head, thorax, and abdomen. They also have six legs. Arachnids have two body parts, the cephalothorax and the abdomen, and they have eight legs. They don't have any wings and they don't have any antenna. Bugs are actually a type of group of insects that are in a group called hymiptrins. These include stink bugs, spittle bugs, mealy bugs, bed bugs, cicadas, leaf hoppers, and tree hoppers. What do arachnids, insects, true bugs, roly polies, millipedes, and centipedes all have in common? They have an exoskeleton. So, what does that mean? It means their skeleton is on the outside of their body. Okay, thank you. I think I'll start counting legs and body segments to help me figure out what I'm looking at. I have another question. I know you like to go outside to explore nature, either on your own or with your kids. Could you give us some tips for the things that you like to have on hand? Now, I have created a little kit that I like to take with me when I go outside and explore nature. What I have in my kit include a little bag, and this is full of colored pencils, crayons, pens, other things that I might need to draw or write my observations down with. I also like to keep a pair of binoculars handy. A ruler is also very handy so that you can take measurements of what you're observing. Magnifying glass is also very handy. I also have these little collection jars. So for example, I might find an insect that I want to take a better look at. So I might catch it in here, take it somewhere, observe it for a while, and release it. I also use this to help me catch. But you don't really need anything this fancy. Just get an old jar or plastic cup and with a lid on it and poke some holes. That way you can keep an eye on what the insect is doing, what it looks like, to maybe help you even draw better. Other things that are useful are sunscreen, insect repellent, and something to drink. And don't forget to ask your parents before you go explore nature. Another important addition to your nature kit is your nature journal. Now nature journals are one of my favorite ways to connect with nature. Nature journals are a record that you keep of your observations in nature. They can also include poems or things that you feel when you're in nature. I like to include information such as the date. I usually include when the sun rises, the sunset, current temperature, and the current weather conditions. Now if I am looking at a bug, I will try to make note of where I see that bug. What habitat is it in? Because oftentimes that's key to figuring out what kind of bug you have. Yes, I'm so glad you brought up nature journaling. That's such a good idea to keep track of all of these insectigations that you might make. And it doesn't have to be anything fancy. If you don't have a notebook, you can always just use a sheet of paper and sketch out what you see in nature. You can go back later and color it in if you wanna make it um, even better. And if you wanna keep track of your nature observations digitally, there are a couple of apps that you might like. <laughs> The iNaturalist app lets you share your pictures with scientists and other app users to build research. If you're younger than 13, you'll just need your parents' permission to create an account. Or if you don't want to post your observations publicly, you can use the Seek by iNaturalist app instead. This will still let you take pictures to identify plants and insects, and you can complete nature challenges to earn badges. Well, I hope you've had fun exploring with me and our local entomology specialist, Lisa. We hope that if everyone takes a little more time to learn about creepy crawlies, they'll turn out to be a little less creepy. Today we've been talking a lot about the creepy crawly bugs, but did you know that bugs also refers to problems in computer code? In fact, back in September of 1947, the very first bug was found in a computer when Grace Hopper found a moth inside of her computer. Back during this time, computers were really, really big. They took up entire rooms. So that moth ended up inside of it, caused a problem, and that was the very first reported computer bug. Also, the word bug can be used to describe a secret listening device to hear conversations and record people when they don't know they're being recorded. 
What did they say? There are lots of ways to preserve creepy crawlies. I have some beautiful bugs here that were preserved in a transparent resin. I didn't make these, I bought them. Soft bodied bugs like spiders do best in a jar of rubbing alcohol. I found this spider lying on the path when I took a walk the other day. Entomologists and bug collectors pin their insects. You may have seen them displayed like this if you've been to a museum or to the zoo. I'm not an entomologist or a bug collector, so I'm gonna show you how to make something like it with stuff you might have at home. You'll need some cardboard, sewing pins, four popsicle sticks, a black marker, a hot glue gun, and some scissors. Now here I am coloring the popsicle sticks with the marker. You can use whatever color you like, but I like the way the black looks in the frame. Then you're gonna hot glue them together in a square shape. Be really careful with the hot glue gun. It's really easy to get burnt. You might need help from a grown up. Then you're going to trace your popsicle stick frame on the cardboard. and cut it out. Then glue the frame onto your cardboard. And you can use a bug that you drew or that you cut out from a catalog or an old magazine page. Tangie's gonna show you how to draw this one a little bit later. Then stick a pin in and you're all done. You can also use an old frame. I got this one at a thrift shop instead of making one out of popsicle sticks. I traced the frame onto the cardboard and cut it out to fit. Then I used some dead flowers that I found outside and some sticks, and I glued on some butterflies that I found in a catalog page and cut out. Great, you're ready to hang your artwork on the wall. Did you know? Did you know that you and I accidentally eat about one to two pounds of bugs a year in our food? We just don't know that it's there because the bugs are in little pieces and not in huge chunks like the worms that I have right here. Bon appetit. So now you know, you already eat bugs. Bugs are pretty much everywhere, so it's not really surprising that they work their way into our food. And tiny bits of bugs are inside of our peanut butter, noodles, even chocolate, and other foods. But that doesn't make them any less delicious. What might be surprising to you is that all over the world, more than two billion people eat bugs on purpose. Here's a fancy word for you, entomophagy. Literally, it means eating insects, although the word is also extended to include other bugs. Here's another word for you, arthropod. An arthropod is an invertebrate with an exoskeleton, so an animal that doesn't have a backbone and their skeleton is on the outside. If you think about it, Eating insects is not that different from eating other arthropods that we're already used to eating, like shrimp, crab, lobster, crawfish. We even call crawfish mud bugs. There are more than 1,900 edible bugs around the globe, and many of those are already included as a regular part of people's diet. I know I've had grasshoppers in Thailand, crickets in Mexico, termites in South Sudan, some other popular menu items include beetles, locusts, mealworms, and more. There are lots of reasons why we should embrace entomophagy. Bugs often have as much protein or more than meat and are rich in essential amino acids, good omega-3 fats, iron, zinc, and nutrients. They also grow quickly, don't take up much space, and generate far fewer greenhouse gases than traditional livestock animals like cows. But also, bugs are tasty. It's just like Pumbaa says, slimy yet satisfying. Although sometimes it's crunchy yet satisfying. Different bugs are valued for their different flavors and textures, but for some reason here in the Western world, we haven't seemed to get past the ick factor. Gourmet chefs and entrepreneurs are working to combat this and to make bugs a gourmet food. Right now online, you can buy gourmet ants, Manchurian scorpions, pizza flavored worms, diving beetles, housefly eggs, and giant June bugs, all for eating. Cricket protein bars and protein powder are more widely available. I've even seen cookies, bolognese sauce, and even chips made out of crickets. I picked up this little packet of crickets at the store. They're Texas barbecue flavored, and they're farmed nearby in Austin. Let's give them a try. 
Oh, you simply must try one of these whole roasted crickets. They're simply divine. Don't eat bugs that you pick up outside. Bugs scooped up from the wild may be covered in pesticides or other contaminants. People who are allergic to other arthropods like shellfish may also be allergic to bugs. Greetings, bug lovers. Let's draw a ladybug. All you're going to need to complete your drawing is a piece of paper and something to draw with. Let's get started. So ladybugs have three main parts to their body and we're going to start our drawing with the pronuntum of the ladybug. The pronuntum helps hide its head, kind of like how a turtle shell does. So to create this, we're going to make the bottom half of a circle. Okay, just like that. And then we are going to make the sides of the head. Oh, I'm sorry, not the head, the pronuntum. Okay, and then we're going to make a line to fill it in. So that's the first part. Now we're gonna go ahead and create a head and we're gonna kind of fill in this circle area up here. So there's our head. And then we're gonna give two circles for eyes and then two antenna. The next thing we're going to do is make the abdomen. And so we're gonna create a small line on both sides and then we're going to create a half circle. And then we're gonna to go to the other side and we're gonna fill in our half circle. So the next thing that we're gonna do is create the elytra. And we're gonna do that by creating a line all the way down the ladybug's body. And then we're going to create another line on top of that, but we're gonna do like a little slant. So right now, this area and this area are the elytra of the ladybug. A lot of people think that they're the wings, but really the wings are actually folded underneath this part, okay? So then we're going to start making our spots. So I'm gonna create a spot up here, and then a spot over here, and I'm creating my spots randomly, so you can go ahead and do that too. Okay. So now that we have one, two, three body parts, we have our elytra, we have spots, now all we're missing is legs, okay? And so we're gonna create three sets of legs because we know that insects have six legs, and we're gonna do this kind of in a series of short and long U's, okay? So up here I'm gonna create a short U on this side, and then a short U on this side, and they're gonna be kind of oblong, okay? And then I'm gonna create a longer U on this side and then another one on this side. And then I'm gonna make a little one. And then I'm gonna give them two little toes or claws. So we know that insects have three parts on their legs. Okay, so that's our first row. And then we're gonna repeat the same process until we have four more legs, or a total of six. And then I think I'm gonna go ahead and fill in some spots on this side, on the head area. Okay, and now we're done. So let's get ready to color it in. Now, ladybugs can come in different types of colors. They can be orange, they can be yellow, they can be brown, they can even be pink. But I like our classic red and black ladybugs. So I'm gonna go ahead and fill her in. Okay, and there we go. Here's our ladybug. Growing up, when I was a child, my favorite thing to do was to use 
random materials and scraps and fabrics to create my own dolls and I would put a show on using what I have. So we're going to use some fun little craft materials and we're going to make a show just for you. And you can learn how to make your own spider craft. So come join me. So in order to make your own fun and fuzzy spider, you're going to need a pom-pom, some chenille stems, and some googly eyes. So let's get started. I pulled out the amount of stems I think I'll need. Let's think, how many legs does a spider have? It has eight, but guess what? I only have four stems. One, two, three, four. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take all these stems and I'm gonna fold them right here and open it, just like I'm making whiskers. And now let's count how many do I have? I think I doubled it. Let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Wow, I have eight legs right here. And then I can put my spider on top and I can even bend the legs. Ooh, creepy crawly. Hmm. There we go. And then all we need to do is put on the eyes, some fun googly eyes, and then we'll just need to glue on our little spider. And once we have our fun spider, we can make our story. Can you think of a song that involves spiders? I'm just gonna take my glue Mm -hmm. And you can use any glue at home. Now I'm going to stick him on. And there we go. I have my fuzzy spider. He's going to be the star of the show. So let's go ahead and make the show. Can you think of a voice for the spider? I'm a spider. <laughs> Maybe you can come up with a different voice at home. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you to a dramatic reenactment of the Itsy Bitsy Spider. Yay! Ah, round of applause! Ah, the curtain's coming up. Ready? out of paper? I challenge you! It's fun! Now that you've made a spider, let's go ahead and make a paper spider web to go along with it. Here are the items that you'll need to make your spider web. You'll need a piece of paper, you'll need an erasable pencil, you'll need a ruler, and a pair of scissors. First thing we need to do is make our paper a square, so I'm going to take the left bottom corner and I'm going to fold it diagonally across my paper until it matches up at the very top. So now you see it's a triangle and we need to get rid of this flap right here to make it a square. So I'm going to take my scissors and cut off the extra paper. Now that we have the triangle, we're going to open it up and we'll have our square and we're going to fold our piece of paper in half. And now that I have my paper folded in half, we're gonna fold it in half once again. 
Now that we've folded our paper in half again, I want everybody to notice on the right side here, we'll have what looks like four pieces of paper. And on the left side, we'll have two. That's what you want. Now what you're gonna do is fold along the diagonal line that's already creased in the paper. Now that we've gotten it into the triangle form, I'm going to mark right about where the center mark is. I'm gonna estimate that. I'm gonna put a mark right there. And I'm gonna go ahead and draw a line that goes from this center point down to the bottom left corner. Now that I have my center line done, I'm gonna go and just do a little small mark on the right side and a little small mark on the left side. You don't wanna to go too far out. So I've gone a couple of millimeters to the right and I've gone a couple of millimeters to the left. And now I'm gonna take my ruler and draw a parallel line, which means it's the same as the line that we just drew. I'm gonna draw another line just like that, so that way it matches what we've already drawn. And we're gonna do that again and draw a parallel line for the other mark. So these two outer lines represent how thick our spider web is going to be. Now I need to draw two lines coming from the center point, going all the way out to each edge that's kind of rounded. This is gonna be the shape of your spider web. Now that I've drawn one set, I wanna create another echo or the same shape. We're gonna parallel that line once again, going out. Whenever we draw these lines, we want them to be in even numbers, not odd numbers. So that way we know where to cut and where not to cut. Now that I've drawn my lines, and don't worry if your lines aren't perfect. Remember in nature, spider webs are never perfect. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna mark the areas that I don't wanna cut with some sort of marker or indication. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make a simple X pattern down the center because I want to keep that. I don't wanna get rid of that. Then I'm gonna count out my lines. And in each set of two, I'm just gonna mark an X and I wanna keep the ones that have a marked X in them. You could also use a marker or a highlighter to indicate which ones you want to keep and which ones you want to cut. Now that I've marked out those lines, I'm gonna take my scissors and I'm gonna cut very gently the areas that don't have an X. I've cut out my spider web and I'm gonna go ahead and recycle all the leftover bits. And now it's time to open up our spider web and see what it looks like. So I'm just gonna gently start peeling the layers apart until we reveal our spider web. What's really cool is each time you do this, they will all look pretty different. And there you go. There's a simple and easy way to make a paper spider web. Bugs show up all over the place in stories. They can be scary or helpful, just like real bugs. Ants, grasshoppers, bumblebees, spiders, caterpillars, they all have their own stories. What are some of the things we usually associate with types of bugs? Can you name anything? We'll say busy as a bee, or talk about how good ants are at teamwork. Caterpillars are often about stories about transformation. Now, Spiders, they have a lot of personalities. Anansi is one of the most famous spiders in the whole world and is commonly considered to be a tarantula. He comes from West African stories and he's known for his clever ways and trickery. One of my favorite stories with him is called Anansi and the Calabash or Pot of Wisdom. Another famous spider is Charlotte from Charlotte's Web. Charlotte is very nice and helps save Wilbur the pig when he's going to be uh, killed in the book. She is known as a barn spider. We also have the famous Very Hungry Caterpillar by Eric Carle, featuring, of course, the caterpillar. Do you know any other caterpillars in stories? 
Alice in Wonderland has a very famous caterpillar uh, character named Absalom. James and the Giant Peach by Roald Dahl has an entire bug cast. Now, this picture here is from the Aesop's fable called The Ant and the Grasshopper. That story is about balancing work and play. Aesop has a lot of bug characters. For more stories of all kinds, check out the Fort Worth Public Library catalog and see what you can discover. I want to suck your blood. from mosquitoes so that we don't get those itchy bites. Would you like to help me out? Yeah. Okay. Well, mosquitoes love water and when it rains, the water is a perfect place for mosquitoes to lay their eggs. So we have to get rid of standing water. How do we get rid of standing water? So some ways to get rid of standing water is to remember to take cups and bowls back inside the house after that cookout. And you can also turn your trash cans upside down so that it doesn't collect water when you're not using it. Oh. You want to know what else you can do? No. So mosquitoes like to bite at night and in the morning. So if you're out from dusk till dawn, make sure that you stay away from areas with a lot of grass and those areas in the shade because that's where they like to hang out. Okay. So Innovation Fairy, what else do you think we can do to keep from getting those itchy bites? Let's wear bug spray. Yes, bug spray. That's a good idea. So bug spray comes in many forms and you can use them as a sticker and they even come as, as a bracelet. But the best thing to wear is bug spray. And then go outside and play. Okay, so before you go outside and play, I'm going to spray you, okay? Okay, I'll see you later. Bye. Bye. It's time for Shakespeare Says. Spiders come not here. Hence, you long leg spinners, hence, beetles black approach not near. Worm nor snail do no offense. This has been Shakespeare Says. The Fort Worth Public Library would like to present a tale of two insects. Yay, let's see what happens. Let's turn up. Once upon a time, there was a spider that lived in a garden. Oh, hello! This is my garden. I like to take care of the plants. Until one day, the spider came across a new creature. Oh, look what I found. It's a friend. How are you doing today? What's your name? Hi. My name is Slug, and I need some water. Oh, let me help you. Let's give you some water. Oh, you're growing. Wow. Did that help you, Mr. Slug? Yes, that helped me a lot. And now I'm going to go and eat all the plants. Oh, no, Mr. Slug, why would you do that? At that point, Mr. Spider decided to use his knowledge and resources to find out what to do. Whoops. Oh, that creature, he said he was going to eat up my garden. I don't know what a slug or a snail does in my garden. Let's look it up using our resources. I'm going to go to the library and get a library book. Okay, let's go. Whee! Oh, 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 it's heavy. Here it is. It's called Rodale's Ultimate Encyclopedia of Organic Gardening. Let's look up the problem. We're going to have to go to the table of contents. So, under table of contents, we're going to look up the letter S because slug and snail starts with S. A, B, C, D. Oh, here it is. I always have to sing the song. Okay, slugs and snails, page 549. Let's go! Let's turn the page. We have to turn the page, unlike some crazy young kids that only use the internet for resources. Books are good too. All right, here we go. <gasps> there it is. Slugs and snails. Ooh, 
Let's read it. Such a big book for a little spider. <gasps> it says, "At night, they emerge and chew large, ragged holes in leaves." Ooh, not my leaves! It says, "Create a diverse garden ecosystem to encourage biological controls." Ants, beetles, grubs, earwigs, flies, birds, snakes, and toads and turtles prey on slugs. Oh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a party, and then they're gonna come and help me control the snails. Okay, let's go. All right, I got my guitar. We're gonna get some friends to come by hosting a dance party. Let's go. Take a minute and look at nature. Take a minute and check it out. Take a minute and look at nature. Check out this cool biodiversity. It's working. We got some friends coming. Let's see. Oh, we have a grub worm. They eat snails. An earwig. <gasps> Ooh, the earwig is gonna eat the snails and slugs. And we have da 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 ants. And by having lots of biodiversity in our garden, we can keep the plants and the snails in check. Oh ho! Take that! Ha 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 ha! Drets spoiled again. I can't eat up your lovely garden. Well, it's okay. We have a good spot for you. It's the compost pile. You can go over there and eat as much as you want. Oh, okay. I think I'm gonna go over there. Thank you, thank you. I love you. I love you too. Bye, bye. Yay! What a great story! Oh, the end. Applause! Ha! Ah, wow! Lots of applause! Ha! Ah. Oh, thank you, thank you. What a great story! We learned so much today. Especially, we learned a lot about biodiversity and how that keeps gardens in balance. And. We should probably go ahead and change the title from "A Tale of Two Insects" to "A Tale of Many Insects." Hooray! Biodiversity! Thank you so much for watching our little show. I had a lot of fun with all my friends and Mr. Spider. <laughs> It was so much fun. But I have a question: How did you do that magic where the slug was growing? Oh, you're curious about that? Let me show you the party trick, and then you can also make your slugs grow at home. The next time you're bored, you can think about doing this party trick. What you're gonna do is take a paper wrap straw, and we're gonna scrunch all that paper down to the bottom. Push, 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 and push, push, push. Make sure it's real scrunched up. The more scrunched up, the more it's gonna grow. And then we're gonna pull this off. And we're gonna put this in this green bowl. I put it in this green bowl so that you can see the difference. And then what you're gonna do is take your straw. I'm gonna take my straw. And I'm gonna put it in the water all the way down. Right here, I have lots of water. The level of water is pretty high. And then I'm gonna put my finger here, and that's gonna trap the water in my straw. You see? Now we're gonna drip it slowly onto our slug and see it grow. Let's see if it'll work. Oh, let's see. The trick is doing a drop at a time. Some fine motor skills required. Oh, it's growing! Grow, slug, grow! What a great party trick! And you can surprise your friends by showing them your magic. Woohoo! That was so much fun. We did lots of activities. We learned how to make our own spider puppets using pipe cleaners and pom poms. We also learned about biodiversity and how to organically take care of slugs in the garden. And my favorite, we got to learn a magic trick on how to make your own growing slug. I hope you had fun. How do slugs and snails move around, and what's the difference? Have you ever wondered that? Well, let's start with what's the difference between a slug and a snail. A slug and a snail are very similar creatures, but the main difference is that the snail has a shell that it can hide in, and a slug doesn't. Snails and slugs are both part of the family called gastropods, which means stomach foot. Well, that sounds pretty silly, but it's basically accurate because the muscle that moves them around is located right underneath their guts. It comes from the Greek roots, and it breaks down like this: gastro means stomach, 
and pod means foot. Instead of separate feet, they move around on one giant muscle on the bottom of their bodies using a rippling motion that pulls them forward along the ground. They make the slime you see in snail trails for lots of reasons. They need it to keep their bodies from drying out, just like the mucus in your nose keeps your nose from drying out. What it does is it reduces the friction on the surface and lets them glide forward on their bellies. And we're gonna redo all of that bit. So, three, two, one, starting over from this background. They make the slime you see in snail trails for lots of reasons. They need it to keep their bodies from drying out, just like the mucus in your nose keeps your nose from drying out. It reduces the friction on the surface to make it easier to move around, like water on a slip and slide lets people glide on their bellies. Slug and snail mucus is made from 98% water with a few extra carbon and protein molecules. The carbon and protein molecules help it to flex and reform as the animal moves. The mucus is sticky until there's pressure applied to it, such as the weight of a slug or a snail. And then it becomes slick to help them glide around. This is how they can move up trees, climb windows, and move over big rocks. The, mu the mucus is also a good protective coating, so they don't get hurt by moving over sharp objects. They can even crawl on top of a razor blade and won't be hurt because of it. Isn't that totally wild? Some bugs, like snails and slugs, use slime to move around, so let's go ahead and make some ooey gooey slime. To make your slime, you'll need clear school glue, contact solution that contains boric acid and sodium borate, You'll need a measuring cup, baking soda, measuring spoons, something to stir with. I'm going to use a popsicle stick. You'll also need a bowl that you can put your slime in and some water. First, I'm going to pour half a cup of the clear glue into my measuring cup. Now that I've moved my glue into the bowl, I'm going to next measure out half a cup of water. Next, I'm gonna take my warm water and I'm gonna mix half a teaspoon of baking soda until it is incorporated and mixed in. Now that I've dissolved my baking soda in my warm water, I'm gonna pour the mixture into my glue and gently stir until they are mixed together. Next, I'm gonna measure out one tablespoon of my contact solution. Once I have it all ready to go, I'm going to mix it in very quickly until my slime starts to pull away from the sides of the bowl. Okay, my slime is starting to pull away from the walls. I did have to go back and add little bits of the contact solution because the first time I put it in, it was just too liquidy. So you can always keep adding in your contact solution until it becomes nice and thick and gooey. Now that I've gotten it the right consistency, I'm gonna go ahead and put some of the contact solution on my hands and I'm gonna just go in and grab some of my slime. And now I have some slime to work with. I can either work with it in the bowl or I can plop it out onto the tray and knead it and get it all nice and gooey. It's important to keep kneading your slime because the more you knead it, the more it becomes less sticky. Because as you can see here, it's pulling away from my fingers now and becomes more manageable and less sticky. And there we go. After kneading it for a while, adding some more contact solution, it is no longer sticky and acts more like slime. This is really fun, and if you let it sit undisturbed for a while, the air bubbles will come out so it'll become more clear and transparent, just like the slime used by snails and slugs. To learn more, visit fortworthlibrary.org. Search the catalog to find everything in the library's collection. Since I know I want to check out a digital book, click on Digital, scroll down to Overdrive, then search for bugs, worms, spiders, and any other creepy crawlies you want to learn more about. You can scroll through all the results, 
or you can filter by categories over on the left, things like type of book, language, and reading level. Our local bug expert, Lisa, recommends the Smithsonian Eyewitness Explorer Bug Hunter book. It has lots of fun activities that help you explore nature at home. Click on Borrow, then type in your library card number to check it out. Let us know how you like any of the books that you check out. And don't forget about the iNaturalist and Seek by iNaturalist apps too. I'm going to keep working on my nature journaling here, but that's our show. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.